Very good afternoon, everybody. If you could hear my voice and see the screen properly, type yes on the chat box. I want whomsoever uh, presence here to acknowledge pastor. If you could hear my voice and see the screen properly, type yes on the chat box. If you could hear my voice and see the screen properly, type yes on the chat box. I want whomsoever present here to acknowledge pastor. If you could hear my voice and see the screen properly, uh, type S on the chat box so that I can able to proceed with the today's session. Today, we are going to deal with the ENT and orthopedics. So speaking about that, speaking about that, the very first area we are going to talk about here is your orthopedics people. So speaking of orthopedics, first one, is your historical importance. Who is the father of uh, orthopedics? That is your Nicholas Andre. And who is the father of British orthopedics? That is Thomas. And the father of modern orthopedics, Sir Robert Jones. Sir Robert Jones. Apart from that, you have a bone disorder, osteoporosis. The very first one we are going to talk about in the uh, orthopedics is your bone disorder. So speaking about the bone disorder, the very first one is your osteoporosis which is your age-related bone degeneration, people. Age-related bone degeneration. So for every normal tissues, you're having this, you know, like a, a osteoid component. For a normal tissue, you have this osteoid component followed by the mineral component. Okay, they two fuse together and will be there properly. But in this case of your osteoporosis, the osteoid component will be very much less while the minerals will be normal. So overall, the bone density will decrease. Overall, the bone density will decrease. And the most common fracture is your vertebral fracture associated with the, uh, you know, like osteoporosis. And uh, most commonly associated with the postmenopausal women due to the lack of estrogen. Due to the lack of estrogen, we studied that yesterday. It will activate the protein. And then that protein will activate the rankle ligand and rankle ligand will convert the pre-osteoclast to osteoclast, and osteoclast will in turn produces the net effect. Osteoclast will in turn produces the net effect of bone degeneration. So investigation of choices, DEXA scan. So whomsoever women, postmenopausal women with the 45 to 46 years of old uh, patient is a postmenopausal woman, then we immediately give a DEXA scan as a screening test. DEXA scan as a screening test. And we use as a T-scoring for the DEXA scan. Zero to minus one is normal. Minus one to minus 2.5 is osteopenia. And less than, more than minus 2.5 is your osteoporosis. Okay. Osteopenia, one to 2.5. And more than 2.5 is so-called as osteoporosis. Okay. Anything less than minus 2.5 is osteoporosis. So we used to see that there is a, you know, like once I was uh, appointed in a, uh, you know, like as a DEXA scan officer, I used to say my job was to, you know, like interpret the results of your DEXA scan of a patient's aging between the 40 to 50 years. They come to the screening for the DEXA scan, especially the postmenopause of women. So we used to ex uh, we used to make our T-score based on the, you know, like a DEXA findings, and then we advise the patients appropriately. So treatment, there is a bone resorption. Decrease in bone resorption can be done by your bypass phonates bisphosphonate and demosumab. Bisphosphonates and denosumab is the drug which can decrease your bone resorption. And increase in bone formation is done by your calcium, vitamin D, and teriparatide uh, supplements. Either we can do the calcium or vitamin D or teriparatide, which is your synthetic PTH analog supplement. Or you have for, uh, to raise your bone resorption and bone formation both, you can use a strontium ranulate. Strontium ranulate. And apart from the surgical management, where you see the vertebroplasty or PMMA fracture, uh, vertebroplasty or PMMA, you can use it to treat the osteoporosis. Okay, most common postmenopausal vertebral fracture is associated with the osteoporosis, where the, the treatment of choice were pretty important. Then you have a Paget's disease. So these are all the bone disorders you are going to see. So Paget's disease, what are the highlight people here? The highlighted area in the pages, this is number one, your blade of grass appearance, flame-shaped appearance, 
picture frame or ivory vertebrae will be there and cotton wool skull cotton wool skull ivory vertebrae plain shaped appearance and blade of grass appearance are the features of paget's disease then you have osteogenesis imperfecta which is your brittle bone disease where the collagen a1 gene mutation patient presented with the multiple diaphyseal fracture with the different stages of healing and along with the blue sclera it's a collagen defect people osteogenesis imperfecta is a collagen disease where you may see blue sclera with the multiple fracture blue sclera with the multiple fracture and then you have osteopetrosis which is so called as endobone where you see the bone within the bone okay where you see the bone within the bone and you may see that there is a erlin meyer flask deformity and you may see there is a erlin meyer flask deformity so we are seeing a four uh, bone disorders people osteoporosis pages disease osteogenesis imperfecta osteopetrosis so osteoporosis which is your age related bone degeneration most common fracture is your vertebra post menopausal dexa scan is a investigation of choice paget's blade of grass appearance and a plain shaped appearance ivory vertebra cotton wool skull osteogenesis imperfecta collagen a1 gene mutation blue sclera multiple diaphyseal fracture with different stages of healing osteopetrosis bone within the bone erlin meyer flask deformity erlin meyer flask deformity then you have a structure of bone what is a structural unit of a bone speaking about the structure of bone what is a structural unit of bone osteon is a structural unit and each osteon composed of water where the children the content of the water is more or the osteoid which is 30 to 35% and minerals which is 60 to 65% and minerals which is 60 to 65% and minerals are calcium and phosphate in the form of your hydroxy apatite calcium and phosphate in the form of your hydroxy apatite and osteoids could be either a cells contributes for 5% and proteins contributes for your 30 to 40% okay 30 to 40% and the proteins are to be collagen one predominantly collagen one would be the predominant one while the cells composed of osteoblast osteoclast and osteophyte osteoblast osteoclast and osteophyte osteoblast is the one which forms your bone while osteoclast is the one which destroys your bone and osteophytes is the one which can able to you know like uh, uh, which can able to synthesize the resting osteoblast so osteoblast which forms the bone which contains alkaline phosphatase and osteoclast which destroys the bone which contains a macrophages so a typical bone composed of water and then you know like a cellular component or osteoid component followed by the minerals so minerals could be calcium and phosphate in the form of hydroxy apatite while you know like osteoid component could be of proteins and cells protein could be type 1 collagen and cells could be of osteoclast osteoblast and osteophyte so speaking about the osteoblast which is a marker is your alkaline phosphatase and osteoclast macrophage is the one uh, which contains a macrophage then structure of a long bone people then structure of a long bone each long bone consist of epiphyses each long bone consist of epiphyses metaphyses and diaphyses each long bone consist of epiphyses metaphyses and uh, uh, you know diaphyses epiphyses and metaphyses are seen predominantly in cancellous bone while your uh, diaphyses are seen predominantly in cortical bone while your diaphyses are seen predominantly in your cortical bone Okay, if you could share my voice and see this.
screen properly, type yes on the chat box. If you could hear my voice and see the screen properly, type yes on the chat box faster, people. If you could share my voice and see the screen properly, type yes on the chat box. If you could hear my voice and see the screen properly, type yes on the chat box. So now speaking about the long bone, now speaking about the long bone, so we are having this, uh, you know, each long bone consists of your epiphyses, metaphyses and diaphyses. So epiphyses and metaphyses are seen predominantly in cancellous bone, while diaphyses are predominantly seen in cortical bone, while the diaphyses are predominantly seen in the cortical bone. So each of this diaph each of this long bone consists of your periosteum and endosteum people. Each of this long bone consists of your periosteum and endosteum. And inside the endosteum, you have this medullary cavity. Inside the endosteum, you have this medullary cavity. And along the uh, epiphyses, you may have the hairpin loop fashion of your blood vessel. Hairpin loop fashion of your blood vessel. Then you are having a layers of growth plate. Speaking about the layers of growth plate, we are having a germinal layer, proliferative layer, and a hypertrophic layer, and layer of calcification. Germinal, proliferative, hypertrophic, and layers of calcification. Then you are having a calcium homeostasis people. So, so far we have discussed about the structure of your human, you know, bone. And now we are going to talk about that. Now we are going to talk about the calcium homeostasis and associated diseases. Calcium homeostasis and their associated diseases. Now speaking about the calcium homeostasis and their associated diseases. Now speaking about the calcium homeostasis and their associated diseases. What is the normal calcium level, people? What is the normal calcium level? That's normal serum calcium level is, the normal serum calcium level is 9 to 11, 9 to 11. And speaking about that, whenever there is a decrease in calcium, there is a stimulation of your parathyroid hormone. Whenever there is a decrease in calcium, there is a stimulation of your parathyroid hormone. And this stimulation of the parathyroid hormone in turn causes, the stimulation of your parathyroid hormone in turn causes shows its activation on three organ. So we used to have this Bailey and Love is having a wonderful text on the surgery about the hyperparathyroidism. That's the text is your bones, groans, and psychiatric moans. The wonderful text we have in the Bailey and Love regarding the hyperparathyroidism is bones, groans, and psychiatric moans. Among that, we talk about the bones here. Among that, we talk about the bones here. Decrease in calcium, will stimulate the parathyroid hormone and the stimulation of parathyroid hormone in turn shows the activity on three areas. In turn shows the activity on three areas. One is your kidney, which stimulates 1-alpha hydroxylase where vitamin D will be uh, increasing the calcium and uh, phosphate reabsorption. And apart from that, it may go and act on the intestine for the reabsorption, uh, so for the dietary absorption of calcium. If nothing is working, then it stimulates the rank L ligand and, and it will activate the pre-osteoclast to osteoclast and osteoclast in turn activates the, uh, you know, like a bone resorption and throws the calcium from the bone to blood in order to maintain it. Okay, now we are having a markers for this calcium homeostasis and associated disorders. Speaking about the markers, the bone formation is seen, uh, bone formation markers are ALP, ALP, Procollagen 1 and Osteocalcin. ALP, Procollagen 1 and Osteocalcin. While bone resorption 1 are trap, n telopeptide C-telopeptide, and the urinary markers are deoxypyridinoline and hydroxyproline. Deoxypyridinoline and hydroxyproline. Okay, so this is all about the calcium homeostasis and about the structure of the bone and about the structure of the bone people. So what is the most common mineral found in the bone, which is your calcium, but in the form of hydroxyapatite. In the form of hydroxyapatite. Now speaking about the vitamin, as we studied about the vitamin deficiency in the biochemistry, we have studied about the vitamin D deficiency in the biochemistry. So rickets and osteomalacia in children and adults. Yes or no? Rickets in children and osteomalacia in 
adel what are the clinical features of your rickets what are the clinical features of your rickets so the head shows a cranio tabus and you have the frontal bossing of skull delayed closure of fontanelle delayed dentition and cranio sinus closure cranio tabus cranio sinus closure delayed dentition delayed closure of fontanelle and you have the frontal bossing of skull then you have the chest in the in the chest you have the rachitic rosary harrison groove and you have the vertebral curvature anomalies like kyphosis scoliosis lordosis and so on kyphosis scoliosis lordosis and so on apart from that you have extremities where you may see the wind swept deformity people okay where you see the wind swept deformity in the case of your vitamin d rickets okay what are the, uh, the things you may see rachitic rosary harrison groove wind swept deformity delayed dentition frontal bossing of skull cranio tabus and cranio synostosis okay cranio tabus and cranio synostosis then you have osteomalacia polyarthralgia or polymyalgia are the clinical features and you may see there is a looser zone or milkman's or pseudo fracture looser zone fracture or milkman's fractures or pseudo fracture and you may also see the cord fish vertebra or fish mouth vertebra classical mcq of your osteo malaysia people cord fish vertebra and your fish mouth vertebra apart from that you may see the trifoil pelvis and treatment is your stoss regimen what is the regimen we use for the osteo malaysia stoss regimen trifoil pelvis cord fish vertebra or fish mouth vertebra looser zone or milkman fracture and then you have a polyarthralgia or polymyalgia polyarthralgia or polymyalgia then you have vitamin c def so lack of conversion of a pro collagen to collagen could result in the vitamin c defect and there are two types of uh, deformities you may see one is your bone another one is your blood vessel is associated with the vitamin c blood vessel you may see the bleeding disorder while the bone epiphysis you might see the wimberger ring sign another classical important mcq wimberger ring sign and metaphysis you may see there is a white line of frankel white line of frankel and tumberfeld zone and pelkan spur tumber tumberfeld zone and pelkan spur you may see it on the metaphysis epiphysis you may see the wimberger ring sign and diaphysis you may see the subperiosteal hemorrhage and diaphysis you may see the subperiosteal hemorrhage where you may see the cortex will be a pencil thin with the grounded glass appearance cortex will be pencil thin with ground glass appearance so these are the vitamin d and c deficiency we have talked about the bone disorder we have talked about the structure of bone we have talked about the bone absorption and resorption markers and then now we are talking about we talked about the vitamin deficiency associated with the bone which is your uh, uh, rickets osteomalacia and vitamin c def what type of findings you may see on the bone we have covered it epiphysis vitamin c def associated with wimberger ring metaphysis white line of frankel trumberfeld zone and pelkan spur diaphysis subperiosteal hemorrhage pencil thin cortex with a ground glass appearance pencil thin cortex with ground glass appearance then you have a bone tumor where you may expect to see the tumor like lesion so tumor like lesion is first one is your fibrous dysplasia and the second one is your bone cyst so speaking about the tumor like lesion as i said fibrous dysplasia where you may see the chinese letter pattern appearance and you may also see on the x ray shepherd crook deformity this is the shepherd crook deformity this is the shepherd crook deformity where you may see x ray shepherd crook deformity and you may see the chinese letter pattern appearance and fibrous dysplasia is mostly associated with mccune albright syndrome speaking about the mccune albright syndrome we have studied about the mccune albright syndrome yesterday uh, in the gynecology we have studied about the triad of your mccune albright syndrome what are the triad of your mccune albright syndrome what is the triad of your mccune albright syndrome recall it people recall it cafe olets part cafe olets part then 
fibrous dysplasia, which we are seeing here, fibrous dysplasia of your bone or polyostotic fibrous dysplasia. And you may see precocious puberty, precocious puberty. Okay, are the three features of uh, three features where it shows the triad of your McEwen Albright syndrome. Yes or no, we studied that in the yesterday in gynecology regarding the precocious puberty. Today we are studying the same thing in the uh, orthopedics for the fibrous dysplasia. Okay, then you have the x ray which shows a shepherd group deformity. Next is a bone cyst, simple and aneurysmal. Simple bone cyst, you may see the fallen leaf sign, and for aneurysmal bone cyst, you may see the blood filled cyst. Aneurysmal bone cyst, you may see the blood filled cyst, while the simple cyst, you may see the fallen leaf sign. Fallen leaf sign. So, we have talked about the two important lesion people. We have talked about the two important lesion of your bone tumors. Next is a bone tumors based on the location. Speaking about the bone tumors based on the location, quite very, 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 very important. So what are the bone tumors based on the location? One is your epiphysis, metaphysis, and diaphysis. So speaking about the tumors which is running on the epiphysis, this is, that is your uh, chondroblastoma, where, you, where which you see the Cardman's tumor, and you see the chicken wire calcification on HPV, where you may see the chicken wire calcification on HPV. Um, HPV. And chondroblastoma is also known as Cartman's tumor. Apart from the Jan cell tumor or osteoclastoma, where X-ray shows soap bubble appearance. X-ray shows soap bubble appearance. So what are the two tumors which arises from the epiphysis? One is your chondroblastoma and another one is your osteoclastoma. Chondroblastoma is a Cartman tumor where you may see the chicken wire calcification, while osteoclastoma is X-ray one where you see the soap bubble appearance, where you may see the soap bubble appearance. Then what is the note? The uh, most common benign tumor of the spine is your hemangioma. Okay, X-ray show jailhouse sign, R striate appearance, and CT shows you, you have this uh, polio dot appearance. You have this polio dot appearance, R jailhouse sign, R jailhouse sign. Then you have a metaphysis, speaking about the metaphysis, which is a simple bone cyst or aneurysmal bone cyst, where you may see the osteosarcoma as a sunray appearance or Cartman triangle or increased ALP are the features of your osteosarcoma. And you have the chondrosarcoma and osteochondroma, which is the most common benign tumor. And you have the enchondroma, which is the most common tumor of your phalanges and non-osteofibroma and non-osteofibroma. Then for a diap diaphysis, Ewing sarcoma, osteoosteoma, osteoblastoma, multiple myeloma, lymphoma, and adamantinoma. Adamantinoma shows a honeycomb appearance on X-ray. Multiple myeloma is the most ma common malignant tumor of your spine. And Ewing sarcoma is associated with 11 is to 12 and MIC2 gene defect, CD99 positive, and onion peel appearance. And onion peel appearance. So what are the tumors which has been arising from the epiphysis, metaphysis, and diaphysis? What are their highlights? So most common benign tumor is, most common benign tumor is osteochondroma, sunray appearance, Cartman triangle, increased ALP. What is the thing you should come into your mind? Osteosarcoma, T translocation of 11 is to 22, and MIC2 gene defects, CD99 positive, onion peel appearance, Ewing sarcoma. And you have the honeycomb appearance on X-ray, adamantinoma. And you have the soap bubble appearance on X-ray, osteoclastoma. Chicken wire calcification on HPE or Cartman's tumor, chondroblastoma. Most common benign tumor of spine, hemangioma. Jailer sign is seen in hemangioma. Striate appearance is seen in hemangioma. Okay, and polka dot is seen in hemangioma. So these are the tumors, bone tumors, and you may see the shepherd crook deformity is seen in fibrous dysplasia associated with McEwen Albright syndrome. Triad is cafe all age spot, polyostotic fibrous dysplasia, and precocious puberty. Fallen leaf sign is seen in simple bone cells. 
while blood filled cyst is seen in aneurysmal bone cyst blood filled cyst is seen in aneurysmal bone cyst okay so these are the important highlights about the bone tumor so we have talked about the bone tumors we have talked about the nutritional deficiency we have talked about the structure of bone and bone disorders and bone degenerative disorders now the area we are going to talk about is your entrapment injury speaking about the entrapment injury cubital tunnel syndrome where you see the ulnar nerve compression meralgia paresthetica where you see the lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh compression lateral cutaneous thigh nerve of thigh compression chiralgia paresthetica where you see the superficial radial nerve compression on rest and tarsal tunnel syndrome posterior tibial nerve injury and a posterior tibial nerve injury should be under the flexor retinaculum and a carpal tunnel syndrome median nerve injury so what are the nerve entrapment injuries cubital tunnel syndrome what nerve will be injured ulnar nerve meralgia paresthetica lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh chiralgia paresthetica superficial radial nerve on rest tarsal tunnel syndrome posterior tibial nerve under the flexor retinaculum carpal tunnel syndrome which is a median nerve carpal tunnel syndrome which is a median nerve so far we have done clear about that now we are going to talk about the fractures now we are going to talk about the fractures speaking about the fractures we are having a classification of the fractures called as a salter and harris classification quite a very 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 important uh, from the mcq perspective so type 1 is where you see the split fracture so split fracture is type 1 and a split fracture along with the thurston filler fragment will be uh, coming out that is type 2 and if the thurston fragment is on the upward it is type 2 if the thurston fragment is on the downward it is type 3 and a type 4 all three layers of the uh, bones are involved epiphysis metaphysis and diaphysis and type 5 is a compression of growth plate type 5 is compression of growth plate so type 1 is split fracture where proximal and distal segment will be there type 2 is proximal and distal segment along with the thurston hall and fragment where you may see the proximal portion of the fragment of bone will be discarded while the type 3 distal fragment will be cut off while type 4 all the four layers will be involved that is your epiphysis metaphysis and diaphysis while type 5 which is a compression of your compression of your growth plate okay apart from that you have fracture in children most common location is distal forearm most common location is distal forearm and most common pattern is your green stick fracture most common fraction is your green stick fracture where the fracture bone will break on the top fracture bone will break on the top so if you put the uh, if you put the you know like a pressure on this two corner and you are trying to bend it if the fracture occurs on the top side then it is a green stick fracture which is most commonly associated with the children or if it is in the inward direction if it is in the inward direction and with, along with the buckling of cortex then it is so called as torus fracture so what is a green stick and a torus fracture so a green stick fracture is outward the fracture while torus is the inward fracture along with the buckling of your cortex so for a management of strategy torus fracture you do the splint and for a green stick fracture you do the osteoclasts followed by the splint osteoclasts followed by the splint okay so what are the fracture in children most common location is distal forearm most common fracture pattern is your green stick fracture management is torus fracture in terms of your uh, in terms of torus fracture you do the splint in terms of green stick fracture you do the osteoclasts along with the splint type 3 of your uh, has a salter and harris classification involved the fracture on the distal segment along with the fragment on the distal portion and type 4 all three layers are involved type 5 compression of growth plate you have to know that and along with that stages in fracture healing stage 1 hematoma formation 2 to 3 days stage 2 granulation or inflammation which is 2 to 3 weeks and then you have a stage 3 callus formation which is a soft callus formation 2 to 3 months and a stage 4 which is your hard callus formation or 2 to 3 years and you have the stage 5 which is a remodeling which is more than 4 3 years so stage 1 hematoma stage 2 granulation stage 3 callus or soft callus formation 
stage 4 is consolidation or hard callus formation while the stage 5 is while the stage 5 is remodeling radiologically visible staging of your fracture healing is stage 3 while clinically visible one is your stage 4 clinically visible one is your stage 4 okay apart from that we are having a non non union mal union non union and mal union so what are the bones which can undergo non union and what are the bones which can undergo mal union the most common bone which undergo mal union is clavicle apart from that supracondyl of your humerus colis fracture and intratrochanteric fracture of the femur gives rise to mal union while the non union ones are your lateral condyle of humerus while you may see the lateral condyle of humerus scaphoid neck of femur and lower one third of tibia and neck of talus lower one third of tibia and neck of talus you may see the non union bone so non union lateral condyle of humerus scaphoid neck of femur lower third of your tibia and neck of talus well mal union clavicle supracondyle of your humerus colis fracture and intratrochanteric fracture of your femur intratrochanteric fracture of your femur then you have the avascular necrosis most common site of your avascular necrosis is head of femur while the most common cause is steroid abuse or thrombophilia or coagulopathy or alcohol or gorgeous disease those are the causes of your avascular necrosis most common cause is steroid abuse while most common site is head of the femur then types of non-union speaking about the types of non-union we may be hypertrophic atrophic or pseudo arthrosis so hypertrophic one where you may see the callus and the defect would be the mechanical defect defect would be the mechanical defect treatment of choices immobilization treatment of choices immobilization for hypertrophic non-union for atrophic callus will not be there both bones are separated both bones are separated while treatment of choices immobilization plus bone graft while most common site is iliac crust while most common site is iliac crust then you have a pseudo arthrosis which is a neglected non-union where you may see the cystic degeneration where you may see the cystic degeneration and in the case of cystic degeneration the most common cause of pseudo arthrosis is idiopathic and apart from that there is a, another cause called as neurofibromatosis or maybe a congenital cause while the treatment of choices osteotomy osteotomy so for hypertrophic immobilization for atrophic immobilization plus bone graft which should be taken up from the iliac crust and pseudo arthrosis should be uh, the treatment of choices osteotomy so we have talked about what are the bones which undergo mal union and what are the bones which undergo non union okay then you have a gustilo anderson classification of bone fracture gustilo anderson classification of bone fracture and type 1 wound less than 1 type 2 1 to 10 and type 3a more than 10 plus contaminated type 3b stripping of periosteum type 3c associated with the vascular injury associated with the vascular injury and then you have a prediction of amputation where you may see the mess score amputation is more than 7 and the salvage is less than 7 you have to do the amputation if the mess score is more than 7 or you can salvage the limp if the uh, mess score is less than 7 if the mess score is less than 7 then you have a fracture management intra articular one open reduction and the internal fixation if it is a extra articular then closed reduction with the pop or if the pop fail for upper limb use the plates followed by the open reduction and internal fixation while for lower limb you can use the nails and rod and you can do the closed reduction and internal fixation closed reduction and internal fixation then you are having a sports injury unhappy triad speaking about the unhappy triad where you may see the mcl acl and medial medial meniscus injury mcl acl and mm injury all three are so called as uh, unhappy triad and your knee joint composed of six ligament people technically your knee joint composed of six, uh, six ligament two cruciate two collaterals and two menisci two cruciate 
two collateral and two menisci. Two collateral ones are medial and lateral collateral, where it can maintain the coronal plane stability. And to investigation of choice for this two collateral ligament is MRI. Test for MCL is valgus stress, and you have the LCL is varus stress. Varus stress. And for a two menisci, medial and lateral menisci will act like a shock absorber. The medial and lateral menisci will act like a shock absorber. Mechanism is twisting of knee. Complained whenever the patient is complaining of a locking of knee with the delayed swelling, with the delayed swelling. And we have the meniscal test. We have a two provocative test. One is your McMurray's test and another one is your Apley grinding test. Okay, McMurray's test and Apley grinding test. And gold standard test for a direction of meniscus is arthroscopy. Investigation of choices, MRI. Investigation of choices, MRI. And two cruciate ligament we are having ACL and PCL. ACL and PCL where you may see the sagittal plane stability and you may see the twisting injury. Complaint is POP or immediate swelling or instability of knee. POP or immediate swelling or instability of knee. And a test where test for ACL is anterior drawer, Lushman test, pivot shift test, and for PCL, posterior drawer test. We studied that in the anatomy itself. Anatomy, the very first session, we talked about the ligaments of your knee joint. There we studied about this. Yes or no? Anterior drawer test, Lushman test, pivot shift test, and posterior drawer test for the detection of cruciate ligament. And for a McMurray's test and apple grinding test is for provocative test for detection of menisci. Varus test, LCL. Valgus test, uh, valgus stress test, which is for MCL. Then you have a bone TB. Speaking about the bone TB, most common bone involved is spine. Earliest spine is your, sign is your paraspinal muscle spasm. You may see the pot spine. Earliest radiological finding is a narrowing of disc space. Earliest radiological finding is the uh, narrowing of disc space. Apart from that, we are having a CTEV, congenital talipus echinovirus. The important one is you are using of the techniques, Dennis Brown's plan, Ponson technique, Dilvoyne, Evans procedure, and CTEV issues are the management strategy for CTEV. I'm not writing here the important, uh, you know, like the uh, findings and, and all, you know the CTEV. So I write the only the management protocol, Dennis Brown's plan, Ponson technique, Dilvoyne, Evans technique, and CTEV issues, and CTEV. Shoes. Then you have a achondroplasia, normal IQ, FGFR3 gene mutation, champagne glass pelvis, bullet nose vertebra, and trident hand or starfish hand. Trident hand or starfish hand. Uh, what are the things you may see it in the achondroplasia? FGFR3 gene mutation, champagne glass pelvis, bullet nose vertebrae, trident hand or starfish hand. Trident hand or Starfish hand is the keywords you look for the achondroplasia. So next is a list of the named fractures we are having: Jefferson, Atlas, Hangman's uh, traumatic spondylolisthesis of your C2. C1 is Jefferson. C2 is uh, Hangman, and you have the T1 spinous process as Clay Shovelers, and you have the horizontal fracture, uh, seat belt injury, especially L1 and L2 is your trans fracture. And apart from that, you have a lower limb fracture, which is your ACL tear, second fracture. And the fracture on the medial condyle of femur is the sled of fracture. And for the ankle injury with the fracture of neck of fibula is Masonia is fracture. And you have a non-displayed spiral fracture of tibia is toddlers. And commuted uh, depressed fracture of lateral tibial condyle is bumper. Commuted fracture of tibial, uh, fractured tibial articular surface with the fibula is your pylons. And apart from that, uh, distal tibial fracture is Gosselin. And you have this uh, you know, trimalleolar ankle fracture, which is your cotton fracture. Bimalleolar ankle fracture is, which is your pots fracture. And shaft of the second and third metacarpal is your March fracture. And a fracture of neck of talus is your aviator fracture. And a fracture on the base of the fifth uh, metacarpal is your ja uh, Janet's fracture. Okay. So, sorry, Jones fracture, March fracture, 
cotton fracture and you have this uh, uh, pilon fracture and bumper fracture are pretty important among that pilon is a uh, tibial articular surface along with the fibula that is pilon fracture lateral tibial condylar fracture is bumpers and you have this trimolar trimalleolar fracture is your uh, you know like uh, cottons bimalleolar fracture is your pods and the neck of the talus is aviator shaft of the second and third metatarsal is march avulsion fracture of the base of the fifth metacarpal is your jones okay avulsion fracture of the base of the fifth metatarsal is your jones then you have apart from that uh, you may have this sort of a you know like a uh, you have this upper limb fractures so speaking about the upper limb fractures you have a galizi fracture of a distal third of radius with the dislocation of a distal radio ulnar joint and montagia proximal third of ulna with the dislocation of a head of radius and uh, apart from that you have a smith fracture reverse of colis while colis fracture we start about the radial distal end of the radial fracture with the uh, segment moving upward and outward while smith inward and uh, downward okay apart from that boxes fracture neck of fifth metacarpal is your boxes fracture neck of the fifth metacarpal is your boxes fracture and apart from that intraarticular fracture across the base of first metacarpal is your rolandos and you have the fracture on the base of first metacarpal is your bennett's dislocation bennett's dislocation so upper limb colis smith galizi montagias rolandos and boxes are the important one and boxes are the important one so apart from that you have a named discipline named osteotomies and named traction pretty straight mcq definitely you may get one named thing so thomas splint fracture of femur aluminum splint immobilization of finger dennis brown ctev shoulder abduction axillary nerve knuckle bender ulnar nerve palsy foot drop splint sciatic nerve or common peroneal nerve palsy dwan rosen splint or craig splint congenital dysplasia of your hip cock up splint radial nerve aeroplan splint brachial plexus among that till now they asked was like your aeroplan cock up knuckle bender shoulder of the dennis brown and shoulder abduction okay was asked and the thomas also these are the uh, you know like a six splints they had asked till now but i had mentioned you the list you can able to mug up if you have a time the important one is thomas splint fracture of femur dennis brown ctev shoulder abduction axillary nerve knuckle bender radial nerve foot drop common peroneal nerve van rosen congenital dysplasia of hip and cock up splint radial nerve palsy aeroplan splint brachial nerve a brachial plexus injury brachial plexus injury and speaking about the named tractions gallows traction traction of shaft of the femur in children less than 2 years 1990 traction traction of shaft of the femur in children perkins traction fracture of shaft of the femur in adults russell's trochanteric fracture box conventional skin traction dunlop supracondylar fracture of humerus and a head alter or crutchfield cervical spine injury halo pelvic thoracic or lumbar spine injury halo pelvic thoracic or lumbar spine injury 1990 is fracture of shaft of femur perkins traction is fracture of shaft of femur in adult russell trochanteric fracture box conventional skin uh, traction dunlop supracondylar fracture of humerus dunlop supracondylar fracture of humerus then named osteotomy mcmurray's fracture on the neck past wells osteoarthritis of hip high tibial osteoarthritis of knee french osteostomy correction of gunstock deformity salter kayari or pemberton's acetabular reconstruction salters kayari or pemberton will be done for the acetabular reconstruction then named bursitis housemaid knee prepatellar bursitis clergyman knee intrapatellar bursitis weaver's bottom ischial bursitis taylor's ankle lateral malleolus and bunian one bunian bursitis on the great toe and you have the moran baker cyst on the popliteal cyst moran baker cyst on the popliteal cyst apart from that most common dislocation of joint knee hip elbow and posterior one 
so spine you have a cervical spine and shoulder anterior sh dislocation patella lateral dislocation is the most common ankle anterolateral dislocation is most common and intra intertarsal chopex dislocation while tarso metatarsal lis frank dislocation is the most common one so most common dislocation is for a knee hip and elbow it is a posterior dislocation and for shoulder it is an anterior dislocation for patella it is a lateral dislocation for ankle it is an anterolateral dislocation tarso metatarsal lis frank intertarsal chopex spine cervical spine dislocation okay cervical spine is the most common dislocated area then we are having a important uh, images in the orthopedics so winking of scapula image where you see the long thoracic nerve injury protrusion of scapula over the shoulder region on coursing against the wall and apart from that you have a pulled elbow which is subluxation of your radial head uh, radial head nurse made elbow or you may call it as a radial head subluxation nurse made elbow wrist drop radial nerve injury ape thumb deformity median nerve injury claw hand ulnar nerve injury partial claw hand ulnar nerve injury complete claw hand ulnar and medial nerve injury ctev clubbed foot image of your ctev and apart from the dennis brown splint apart from that dennis brown splint and you have a aeroplane splint for a brachial plexus injury dinner fork deformity uh, which is seen in the coli structure cock up splint cock up splint usually for a carpal tunnel syndrome and you know lift off test lift off test commonly used for the tear of your subscapularis tendon and coli fracture where you see the dinner fork deformity reversal of coli smith fracture and night stick fracture where you see the ulnar shaft will be, had been broken and apart from that you have a shaffer fracture where you see the radial styloid process has been fractured over here in this x ray and you have the pot fracture bimalleolar fracture pot fracture you may see that there is a bimalleolar fracture and a pilon fracture pilon fracture interarticular tibial fracture is your pilon fracture aviator fracture neck of the talus and apart from the jones fracture you may see there is a small line and you have a dynamic hip screw galizi fracture galizi fracture montagia fracture montagia fracture and anterior dislocation of the hip posterior dislocation of the hip and symphysis pubis x ray image of here symphysis pubis and a brian traction which is used for the gallows and bucks and gunstock deformity supracondylar fracture of your humerus and you may see the gallows traction here and uh, apart from the rocker bottom okay these are the important ones taylor's brace for thoracic spine and salt and pepper skull for hyperparathyroidism and uh, cock up splint for radial nerve injury and knuckle bender splint this image was asked several times in fmge and a trendelenburg test weakness of gluteus medius and minimus and mallet finger or baseball finger and von rosen splint austin mure prosthesis thompson one rolando fracture where you see the fracture of your first metatarsal sorry metacarpal and a jersey finger uh, apart from that you have the glass folding cast of scaphoid fracture and you may see the four post collar taylor's brace somi brace and milkwake brace and boston brace these are the image based questions that may you may expect to see it in the fmg quite a important orthopedics images named braces and their pictures and their conditions and apart from that named fractures and you have the named injuries so we have done everything in the orthopedics we have done the bone tumors nutritional disorders joint tears salter and harris classification gustavo gastillon classification and then we talked about your bone degenerative disorders we talked about your bone structure and function and we talked about your named fractures and named splints named management techniques that is your uh, osteotomies osteotomies and all those things we have done and we have discussed about the important images too so this material is compact material if you have read this material again i am saying you out of 5 
three can be scored out of five three can be scored relaxedly you can do it and you can get it done okay so with this uh, we we finished the orthopedics and we move on to ent after a 10 minutes of break so see you all by 4 pm so we can able to do the uh, you know like a ent ent is also one of the easy subject so we can finish it in a one hour or maximum one and a half hours we can finish the ent too so no problem so today we are doing a ent and a orthopedics so have a nice day people see you all after the break
Okay, very good evening, everybody. So we are resuming the session. The next session is your ENT. Uh, speaking of a ENT, speaking of a ENT, we are going to start about the uh, we are going to start about the ENT. So the high yield areas in the ENT where uh, you know, like uh, we used to call that the important things is your anatomy and the physiology of ENT. Anatomy and the physiology of ENT are the very, very high yield area. Apart from that, there are certain diseases like otitis media, Meniere's disease, Meniere's disease, otosclerosis, otosclerosis, and so on. So these are the diseases where you may expect to see here important diseases that you have to remember. And apart from that, the anatomy and physiology of ENT will cover you seven to eight questions. So understanding them is pretty, pretty important people. So we discuss about the ENT high yield areas. So speaking about the ENT, anatomy of ear, we divide the anatomy of ear into three portions, external ear, middle ear, and inner ear, external ear, middle ear and inner ear are the three portions we divide the anatomy of ear so external ear is further divided into pinna pinna tympanic membrane and external auditory canal while the middle ear pinna plus ear ossicles while the inner ear contains the organ of cortex so very 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 important mcq is this organ of cortex is located in where inner ear the organ of cortex is located in inner ear then you have external ear pinna where the external ear elastic cartilage with the yellow color elastic cartilage with the yellow color so remember p for 3p pinna perichondritis and pseudomonas infection so for external ear the first area is the outermost area which is the external cartilage with the yellow color where the pinna 3p first p is for pinna second p is for perichondritis that is your uh, infection uh, and apart from that uh, inflammation of your perichondrium and infection that is your pseudomonas infection okay and what type of cartilage is this pinna as we said it is a uh, elastic and avascular cartilage it is a elastic and avascular cartilage and derives most of its nutrient from the perichondrium people and derives most of its nutrient from perichondrium and stripping of the perichondrium is seen in boxes ear or cauliflower ear stripping of perichondrium is seen in boxes ear or cauliflower ear very 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 important so external ear the first one is your pinna tympanic membrane and external auditory canal so speaking about that external ear pinna which is the elastic avascular cartilage and perichondritis and pseudomonas infection association so Avascular derives this nutrient from the perichondrium. Stripping of a perichondrium is seen in boxes ear or cauliflower ear. Boxes ear or cauliflower's ear. Then you have a development. So speaking about the development, you have a six axonal hillock. Speaking about the development, you have a six axonal hillock where the pharyngeal arch one and two will be the derivatives. So we are having a six uh, axonal hillock, axonal hillock one, two, three, four, five, and six. Among that, the first one is so-called as tragus. First one is so-called as tragus, which is a uh, second one is so-called as helix. Second one is helix. Third one is simba concha. Fourth one is concha. Fifth one is anti-helix. And the sixth one is anti-tragus. Sixth one is anti-tragus. Among that, your concha is the most important part of your mastoid antrum and trag between your tragus and helix there lies a structure called as incisura terminalis incisura terminalis is the structure which lies between your tragus and helix tragus and helix so apart from that you have external auditory canal as we said like a pinna and external auditory canal and tympanic membrane are the component of your external ear so pinna we have studied it is the outermost layer now, speaking about the external auditory canal, so this external auditory canal is containing a two parts. One is a cartilaginous part, another one is a bony part. Okay, first one is a cartilaginous part, another one is your bony part.
the outer one third is cartilaginous part while the middle inner two third is a bony part and external auditory canal derived from first bronchial cleft external auditory canal is derived from first bronchial cleft on the outer uh, cartilaginous one third you have an important landmark called as fissure of santorini fissure of santorini where you may see the parotid infection spread where you may see the parotid infection spread then you have a bony two third where you may see the two one foramen and one ridge the ridge is so called as isthmus and the foramen is so called as foramen of kushka and the foramen of kushka developed by 6 years okay foramen of kushka developed by 6 years and isthmus is one of the tricky landmark wherever the foreign body get lodged will be difficult to remove where the foreign body get lodged will be difficult to remove on the fissure of your santorini on the fissure of your uh, sorry on the isthmus okay so isthmus you are having a attachment and uh, isthmus is a tricky part where lodging of a foreign body in the isthmus will be very very difficult to remove so this is all about the pinna and external auditory canal people so speaking about the pinna speaking about the pinna uh, three p's pinna perichondritis and pseudomonas and cartilaginous derived nutrients from the perichondrium stripping of perichondrium is boxer's ear or cauliflower ear external auditory canal derived from the first bronchial cleft outer one third is a cartilaginous while the inner two third is a bony one the cartilaginous contains a fissure called as a fissure of santorini while the inner bony part contains a foramen of kushka and isthmus whenever the foreign body get lodged in the isthmus it will be difficult to remove and length of the external auditory canal is 24 mm and we have a hitzelberger sign where you may see the hypoesthesia of your posterior mental wall of external auditory canal hypoesthesia of posterior mental wall of external auditory canal could result in hitzelberger sign hitzelberger sign then you have a tympanic membrane speaking about the tympanic membrane so you are having the sparse placenta and the sparse plana so you are having a normal area of tympanic membrane is 90 mm per square while the functional area is 55 mm of square okay while the functional area is 55 mm of square we are having a pars placida and a pars plana and inside that you have a umbo which is a most reliable landmark on otoscopy and you have the annulus tympanicus and notch of rivinus around it so a majority of area is pars plana and a pars placida and you have the notch of rivinus and annulus tympanicus there and you have the small depression called as umbo umbo is the most reliable landmark in otoscopy then you have the prusak space which is a most common site for cholesteatoma most common site for cholesteatoma is prusak space so apart from that you are having a middle ear so as we said the pars tensa and the pars placida so speaking about that you are having a uh, the inner ear is divided into epitymphanum mesotymphanum and uh, hypotymphanum so narrowest part of your Uh, inner ear or middle ear is so called as your epitym uh, uh, mesotympanum and your uh, your uh, tympanic membrane is connected with the eustachian tube the check uh, test for checking the patency of the eustachian tube will be valsalva maneuver polizer test polizer test and toyn bee test valsalva maneuver polizer test and toyn bee test are the test used for the direction of checking the patency of your uh eustachian tube then you have that uh, tympanic membrane which is attached with the malleus incus and the stapes and the stapes so it contains a food process and the food process is attached with the oval window and the food process is attached with the oval window so speaking about the malleus and incus which is derived from the pharyngeal arch 1 while the stapes it is a pharyngeal arch 2 while the inner one are the food process of the stapes or it is coming from the over aortic capsule very 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 important mcq embryological origin of food process of step is aortic capsule okay aortic capsule so whenever the sound hits on the tympanic membrane the tympanic membrane will vibrate and vibration will pass through the malleus malleus will hit the incus incus will hit the step and the steps will uh, food process of the steps will hit the oval window 
okay food process of the steps will be hit in the hitting the oval window apart from that you have a mastered antrum air sinus in your petros uh, temporal membrane which completes by 4 to 6 years of age and a surgical landmark of a mastoid antrum is spine of your hankian mckeevan triangle okay apart from that inner ear which contains a bony labyrinth and the membranous labyrinth which contains a perilymph and endolymph and it contains a three semicircular canal people it contains a three semicircular canal where superior posterior and lateral among that all three lies at the right angles to each other all three lies at the right angles to each other then you have a vestibule central portion of your bony labyrinth is so called as your vestibule central portion of the bony labyrinth is so called as vestibule and apart from that you have a membranous lab labyrinth where you see the scala media and inner you may see the cochlear duct cochlear duct to saccule and you have this uh, you know like a between your cochlear duct and the saccula you have this ductus reunions ductus reunions okay these are the outer middle and inner ear that you have to remember then you have a tuning fork test most common frequency in the tuning fork test is 512 hertz least sensitive is schaback test most sensitive is weber's test while the most sensitive is weber's test so tuning fork most common frequency is 512 hertz least sensitive is schaback test most sensitive is weber's test and otosclerosis the test to be uses is your gulley's test otosclerosis the test to be uses is your gulley's test okay and speaking about that you are having a two types of hearing loss one is your conductive hearing loss and another one is your sensory hearing loss conducting hearing loss and sensory hearing loss so what are the conductive hearing loss and snhl sensory neural hearing loss what are the difference between them by comparing with the test so test and the ent are pretty important especially rennie's test for a conductive hearing loss bone conduction will be more than air conduction so for a bone conduction will be more than air condi air conduction and rennie's test which show the conductive hearing loss and in the sensory neural hearing loss air conduction will be more than the bone conduction air conduction will be more than the bone conduction apart from that you have a weber's test lateralized to the affected one is a uh, weber's test in the conductive hearing loss lateralized to the affected ear in the case of conductive hearing loss and lateralized to the normal ear in terms of your sensory neural hearing loss and lateralized to normal ear in terms of your sensory neural hearing loss and schwaback is lengthened in conductive and schwaback is shortened in sensory neural schwaback is lengthened in conductive one schwaback is shortened in sensory neural and apart from that you have sds which is a good in the conductive and poor in the sensory neural okay then you have a gallis test bone conduction is unaffected in the otosclerosis bone conduction will be unaffected in the otosclerosis length and schwaback test is seen in conductive hearing loss lateralized to the normal ear on the weber's test is showing in the sensory neural hearing loss where air conduction is equal to bone uh, sorry air conduction is more than bone conduction in sensory neu uh, neural hearing loss and you have the poor sds and sensory neural hearing loss so these are the test where the difference is between you see the uh, you know like a conductive hearing loss and sensory neu neural hearing loss okay most common frequency tuning fork is 512 hertz uh, least sensitive is schwaback most sensitive is webers and for test for otosclerosis is gallis test and when you do the gallis test bone conduction will remain unaffected in the case of your bone conduction will remain unaffected in the case of your otosclerosis otosclerosis then you have otosclerosis important diseases otosclerosis is associated with the pregnancy otosclerosis is associated with the pregnancy and it shows a bilateral progressive deafness along with the tinnitus people bilateral progressive deafness along with tinnitus is seen in otosclerosis and you have a paracusis wilsi the patient can hear better in the noisy environment patient can hear better in the noisy environment that is your paracusis wilsi which is a phenomenon seen in the otosclerosis associated with the pregnancy 
progressive def deafness along with the tinnitus and you have the better uh, patient can hear better in the noisy environment in paracusis wilchi and the patient may shows a positive schwartz sign patient may show the positive schwartz sign and apart from that rice grain or biscuit type of appearance you may see rice grain or biscuit crumb type of appearance you may see and treatment of choices tapidectomy with artificial prosthesis so tapidectomy with artificial prosthesis we uses for the otosclerosis so what are the things you have to remember for the otosclerosis people associated with the pregnancy bilateral progressive deafness along with the tinnitus paracusis welchi which a patient can hear it in the hear better in the noisy environment positive schwartz sign rice grain or biscuit type of appearance treatment of choices stapidectomy with artificial prosthesis then you have a minias disease where you see the increased endolymph volume increased endolymph volume unilateral hearing loss or attack of vertigo and fluctuating sensory neural hearing loss and you may see hennebert sign positive and tulios phenomenon hennebert sign positive one tulios phenomenon in that case of your many years disease people so this what are the things you have to remember in the case of your uh, uh, many years disease so the in the case of your many years disease the first thing you have to remember is the endolymph volumes volume will be more endolymph volumes volume will be more and apart from that you may see the unilateral hearing loss attack of vertigo fluctuating sensory neural hearing loss hennebert sign positive and tulios phenomenon positive what is this tulios phenomenon people what is this tulios phenomenon eye movement eye movement i movement in response to the sound i movement in response to the sound is so called as in response to the sound is so called as tulios phenomena and this tulios phenomenon is seen in many years disease so increased endolymph volume unilateral hearing loss attack of vertigo or fluctuating sensory neural hearing loss followed by hennebert sign followed by tulio phenomenon where you see the eye movement which is uh, in response to the sound apart from that asom stage of tubal occlusion you are having a four stages tubal occlusion pre suppuration suppuration and resolution so what are the four stages of asom tubal occlusion pre suppuration suppuration and resolution so what type of uh, signs you may see it in the what type of stage of asom so for a pre suppuration cartwheel appearance you may see for a pre suppuration cartwheel appearance you may see and for a stage of suppuration nipple sign or lighthouse sign you may see nipple sign or lighthouse sign you may see so cartwheel appearance nipple sign or lighthouse sign in the suppuration and tympanic membrane rupture in the case of your resolution okay tympanic membrane rupture in the case of your resolution while well, the treatment of choices the treatment of choices myringotomy treatment of choices myringotomy and most common organism is strep pneumo most common organism is strep pneumo okay so asom what are the things you have to remember one is your four stages what are the four stages tubal occlusion pre suppuration suppuration and resolution so pre suppuration cartwheel appearance and suppuration nipple sign or lighthouse sign and resolution tympanic membrane rupture resolution tympanic membrane rupture and treatment is myringotomy and most common organism is strep pneumo and aero otitis media you may see the air bubble or retraction pocket okay aero otitis media you may see the air bubble or retraction pocket and serous otitis media you may see the pot belly appearance serous otitis media you may see the pot belly appearance and tb otitis media you may see the camphor eyes appearance you may see the camphor eyes appearance so we are having a three types of otitis media aero otitis media serous otitis media and tb otitis media 
So aero otitis media, air bubble or retraction pocket, serous otitis media, pot belly appearance, and a TB otitis media, camphor eyes appearance you may see. Camphor eyes appearance, you may see it in this acute suppurative otitis media, acute suppurative otitis media findings. So these are the important findings you may see it in the case of ASOM people. So Tulio phenomenon, Henneberg sign, Menias disease, and you may see that there is a paracusis wilchai, otosclerosis, rice grain appearance or biscuit appearance, otosclerosis, nipple sign, stage of separation of ASOM, lighthouse sign, stage of separation of ASOM, cartwheel appearance, stage of pre-separation of your ASOM, treatment of choices, myringotomy, treatment of choices, myringotomy. Okay, apart from that, you have a chronic superative otitis media. Chronic superative otitis media, speaking about it, it is more than three months. Any superative otitis media of more than three months, most common organism is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And you may see the window shielding effect. You may see the window shielding effect. And CSOM will be safe or unsafe. For a safe CSOM, there is no cholesteatoma. There is no cholesteatoma. And you may see there is a central perforation. You may see the central perforation and absence of cholesteatoma in safe chronic superative otitis media. While unsafe, where you may see the cholesteatoma. And apart from that, marginal or attic perforation, you may see it in the case of your unsafe chronic superative otitis media. Okay, unsafe variety is seen in the marginal or attic perforations of your CSOM and you may see the cholesteatoma in the case of unsafe while in the case of safe there is a lack of cholesteatoma and a central perforation. Then complication of otitis media most common cause of ASOM is uh, acute mastoiditis. Most common cause of ASOM is acute mastoiditis and the most common cause of CSOM is intracranial it is meningitis. And for extracranial, it is acute mastoiditis. Intracranial, it is meningitis. And extracranial, it is acute mastoiditis. Then you have an acoustic neuroma. So speaking about that acoustic neuroma, you have a vestibular schwannoma and a benign encapsulated slow growing one, benign encapsulated slow growing one. And acoustic neuroma is an eighth cranial nerve tumor, eighth cranial nerve tumor. Apart from that, you have a glomus tumor, most common benign tumor, no FNAC, rising sun appearance and a FELP sign in CT and you may see the salt and pepper sign in MRI. Salt and pepper sign in MRI in terms of your glomus tumor and a FELP sign in CT in terms of glomus tumor and vestibular schwannoma is associated with the acoustic neuroma. Vestibular schwannoma is associated with the Acoustic neuroma. So these are the diseases associated with the ENT and anatomy of ENT, test for ENT, and these four will cover the important highlights in the ENT people. You can able to answer two to three questions in the year if you know these things. Then important images. We are having a variety of X-ray views in the ENT. First one is your water view. Another one is your Caldwell's view. And you have a submento vertex view. And you have a Rees view. And then you have the Rees view. These are the X-ray type of view. They may ask you what type of view is used here. And you have a hemotymphanum, presence of blood in the tympanic cavity, usually associated with the basal skull fracture. Basal skull fracture. You may also see the battle sign in the basal, cell fra basal skull fracture. Then you have a glue ear, adhesive otitis, where you may see the middle ear, middle ear is filled with the fluid and the glue ear is due to the middle ear infection. Then you have a ASOL cartwheel appearance, cartwheel appearance of your ASOM, and you have a glomus tumor. This is your glomus tumor, and you have a Schwarzy sign. You have the Schwarzy sign, and this Schwarzy sign, you may see it in the otospongiosis. And apart from that, you have a Ludwig angina. Speaking about the Ludwig angina, where you may see it on the floor of the mouth. And apart from that, there are certain instruments you have to know. Killian's nasal speculum, you use this for the septoplasty. 
and myringotomy used to incise the tympanic membrane and the bayonet shaped nasal gauze used to remove the bony spur used to remove the bony spur so these are the important ones you may see it in the case of your ear so these are the important things you may see it in the case of your ear most common site for cholesteatoma is prusak space while you have a hennebeck sinus sin and many as disease schwarze sinus sin and otosclerosis so here it is a otospongiosis schwarze sin and apart from that you have a, a cartwheel appearance you may see it in the uh, acute suppurative otitis media most common cause of asom is acute mastoiditis most common cause of csom intracranial is meningitis extracranial is acute mastoiditis and for the case of your unsafe chronic suppurative otitis media where you may see the marginal marginal or atic perforation or atic perforation most common organism causing a uh, csom is your pseudomonas aeruginosa most common organism causing the csom is pseudomonas aeruginosa aero otitis media air bubble appearance or retraction pocket serous otitis media where you may see the pot belly appearance tb otitis media where you may see the camphor eyes appearance where you may see the camphor eyes appearance so these are the things you need to know in terms of your ear people now we move on to the nose so speaking about the nose so speaking about the nose we are having anatomy of your nose we are having a internal and external nose internal and external nose speaking about the internal nose we are having a nasal vestibule and nasal cavity proper nasal vestibule and nasal cavity proper while the external nose upper one third is a bony part where it is formed by the pair of nasal bone pair of frontal bone and pair of maxillary bone okay all three will form the upper one third of your bony part while lower two third is your cartilaginous part where you may see the three paired cartilage and the three unpaired cartilage sorry three paired cartilage and one unpaired cartilage that one unpaired cartilage is the anterior part of your septal cartilage anterior part of your septal cartilage while the three paired cartilages are upper lateral lower lateral and sesamoid one upper lateral lower lateral and sesamoid one and nerve supply of your lower one third lower two third cartilaginous part is your ophthalmic nerve and maxillary division of your trigeminal nerve ophthalmic nerve and maxillary division of your trigeminal nerve is the one you may see the nerve supply of your external nose with the two third of your cartilaginous part then you have the lymphatic supply speaking about the lymphatic supply where you may see speaking about the lymphatic supply where you may see the submandibular and periauricular lymph node involvement will be there then you may have uh, then you may have the in, uh, then you may have the inner one uh, so speaking about the inner one and uh, prior moving on to the inner one we are having a rhinion and a lemon nasi what is this rhinion and a lemon nasi rhinion is the pa part rhinion is the part where lower end of the cartilaginous part meet with the lower end of your internasal septum lower cartilaginous part will meet with the lower end of your internasal septum that part is so called as rhinion while lemon nasi is the site for intercartilaginous incision during the rhinoplasty intercartilaginous incision during the rhinoplasty that is your lemon nasi while your rhinion is the one where you may see the part where the lower end of the cartilaginous part Uh, along with the internasal septum then speaking about the internal nose so we talked about the external nose upper one third bony part it is formed by nasal bone frontal bone and maxillary bone lower part cartilaginous part three paired and one unpaired one unpaired is the anterior part of septal cartilage while the three paired one is your upper lateral lower lateral and sesamoid one now supply ophthalmic nerve and maxillary division of trigeminal nerve rhinion part where the lower part of your cartilaginous part meet with the lower end of your internasal septum lemon nasi site of the intercartilaginous incision during rhinoplasty intercartilaginous incision during rhinoplasty is your lemon nasi then you have a nasal vestibule then you have a nasal vestibule where you may see the stratified squamous epithelium 
stratified squamous epithelium and contains a hair follicle called as vibrace okay hair follicle called as vibrace okay or vibrace however you call it as you can able to call it as okay apart from that you have an internal nasal wall speaking about the internal uh, nasal wall this internal nasal wall is medially bounded by the nasal septum internal nasal wall is medially down and uh, medially bounded by your nasal septum laterally by your limen nasi and inferior turbinate and inferiorly by your floor of cribriform aperture inferiorly by your floor of cribriform aperture laterally by your nasal limen nasi and inferior turbinate while medially by the nasal septum medially by the nasal septum these are the internal nasal walls boundaries okay apart from that as we said it is having a nasal vestibule and nasal cavity proper nasal vestibule we have talked about it it is a stratified squamous epithelium with the hair follicle uh, contains a hair follicle called as vibrace and internal nasal wall medially nasal septum laterally limen nasi and inferior turbinate while inferiorly floor of cribriform aperture while apart from that you are having a nasal cavity proper nasal cavity proper contains only the medial and lateral part okay only the medial and lateral wall while the septum medial wall composed of your crest of your nasal bone and nasal spine of your frontal bone crest of your nasal bone and nasal spine of your frontal bone will be there and apart from that on the lateral side you may have the crest of your maxillary bone and you may have the crest of your palatine bone crest of your maxillary bone and palatine bone will be there on the floor you may have the septal cartilage and perpendicular plate of ethmoid bone and you may have the omer bone and you may have the omer bone and at the rostrum of the sphenoid bone have a small attachment that is called as syndylysis very 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 important mcq the joint between your rostrum of your sphenoid and omer is so called as sin dialysis okay so the medial wall is formed by nasal bone crest and nasal spine of frontal bone while lateral one crest of your maxillary and crest of your palatine one and in the floor septal cartilage perpendicular plate of ethmoid bone and omer bone where the point where the rostrum of sphenoid is attached with the uh, you know like a omer that point is so called as or the joint is so called as shin dialysis okay shin dialysis apart from that you may have a little area which is a highly vascular area where you may say little area is supplied by four artery that's why little area is so is a most common site of your epistaxis okay anterior is via the kesselbach plexus while posterior is via the woodruff plexus kesselbach plexus is mediating the anterior epistaxis while woodruff plexus is mediating the posterior epistaxis so now another important mcq people what are the uh, arteries which contributes to this little area what are the arteries which contributes to this little area one is your anterior ethmoidal artery anterior ethmoidal artery which comes from the ophthalmic artery and which in turn comes from the internal carotid artery internal carotid artery gives rise to ophthalmic artery ophthalmic artery contains the anterior ethmoidal artery and the second one is your sphenopalatine artery and the greater palatine artery which are the branches of your maxillary artery which are the branches of your maxillary artery and the fourth artery is your septal branch of superior labial artery septal branch of superior labial artery which is a branch of your facial artery so septal branch of superior labial artery is your facial artery greater palatine and splenopalatine is your maxillary artery both are the branches of your external carotid artery and internal carotid artery gives rise to ophthalmic artery ophthalmic artery gives rise to anterior ethmoidal artery anterior ethmoidal artery then you have a lateral wall speaking about the lateral wall it gives rise to superior turbinate middle turbinate and inferior turbinate and uh, above the superior turbinate you have a superior sphenoethmoidal recess where the sphenoidal sinus drains so where does the sphenoidal sinus drains on the sphenoethmoidal recess and on the superior meatus we are having this posterior ethmoidal sinus and middle ethmoidal sinus okay posterior ethmoidal sinus and middle ethmoidal sinus are located on superior meatus 
where the superior meatus is the space between your superior turbinate and inferior turbinate. Okay, so we are having the superior meatus which contains the two sinus draining into them. What are they? One is your posterior ethmoidal, another one is your middle ethmoidal. Posterior ethmoidal and middle ethmoidal. And below the uh, middle ethmoidal, you have the inferior meatus which is running between your middle and the inferior turbinate. This middle ethmoidus will contains a bullet ethmoidal, bullous ethmoidalis, and it may also contains a hiatus semilunaris. So hiatus semilunaris and bullous ethmoidalis are the two bony two landmarks which you see that you see it in the middle meatus. And apart from the two other one is your infundibulum and anterior ethmoidal sinus, and you may see the draining of your anterior ethmoidal sinus. And the frontal sinus drains into the infundibulum. Infundibulum is located in the middle meatus. So, uh, and apart from that, you have an inferior meatus. So, speaking about that inferior meatus, you are having a maxillary sinus, which is located, uh, which is the, the you know, like a dry, uh, draining into the hiatus semilunaris. And then you have this nasolacrimal duct, or uh, uh, which is down on the inferior meatus. And you have the superior and middle meatus drain derived from the ethmoid bone while inferior meatus derived from the separate bone which are articulated with the ethmoidal bone. So first thing, above the superior turbinate, spinoethmoidal recess where you see the spinoidal sinus and superior meatus, superior and uh, sorry, posterior and anterior ethmoidal sinus. Uh, while the middle meatus contains the four important structures. One is your anterior ethmoidal sinus drainage. Another one is the infundibulum where the frontal sinus will drain. And then you have a hiatus semilunaris where the maxillary sinus will drain. And then you have a bullous ethmoidalis. Okay, bullous ethmoidalis. Okay, then you are having an inferior meatus where you may see the lac nasolacrimal duct. Very, very classical MCQs. Till now, they had seen in the, you know, like a ENT is this nasolacrimal duct drains into where? Inferior meatus. Inferior meatus, which is below the inferior turbinate which is below the inferior turbinate. Apart from that, you are having ethmoidal sign, ethmoidal cells, which gives you a honeycomb appearance. So anterior ethmoidal cells, also known as stellar cells, which is forming an infundibulum. And then you have a middle, which is an ethmoidal bulla. And then posterior is also known as onodi cells, which is draining into the superior meatus. This onodi cells is very, 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 very important, which drains into the superior meatus. So these are the important things uh, regarding your anatomy of nose people. So what are the arteries which forms the uh, little area? Anterior ethmoidal, spinopalatine, greater palatine, subtal branch of your superior labial artery. Subtal branch of your superior labial artery. Most common site of anterior epistasis is Kesselbach plexus, while most common site of posterior epistasis is Woodruff plexus. Okay, most common site of posterior epi epistasis is Woodruff plexus. Then you have ethmoidal cells where you see the honeycomb appearance. Anterior ethmoidal cells is also known as Heller cells, while posterior one is Onodi cells where you may see the superior meatus. Okay, apart from that, you have a rhinitis. So speaking about the rhinitis, we are having a variety of rhinitis. One is your allergic rhinitis, which is an air allergic no absence of allergy and treatment with antihistamines and steroid. Then you have a vasomotor rhinitis, which is a non-allergic one. Atropic rhinitis, where you may see the mucosal thinning and wide nasal polyp, nose block, and there is a absence of smell. Patient cannot able to feel the smell in atropic rhinitis. The operation we do for the atropic rhinitis is Young's operation. Okay, operation we do for the atropic rhinitis is Young's operation. Apart from that, you have a rhinitis medicomentosa where you use the overdose of your nasal decongestant could result in the rhinitis. That is a rhinitis medicomentosa. And the secondary atro atrophic rhinitis is due to the uh, systemic diseases such as SLE or leprosy or scleroderma. So five types of rhinitis people, allergic, air allergic, treatment is antihistamines and steroid. Vasomotor, non-allergic, atropic, mucosal thickening with a wide NP along with the nose block, loss of smell, where the operation is Young's operation. 
rhinitis medicomentosa over use of nasal decongestant secondary atrophic rhinitis is due to systemic diseases where you may see the sle and leprosy and scleroderma sle leprosy and scleroderma apart from the order of development of sinus where you may see the maxillary sinus ethmoidal sinus sphenoid sinus and frontal sinus maxillary ethmoidal sphenoidal and frontal sinus among that the maxillary sinus will develop from 4 to 5 months maxillary sinus develops on 4 to 5 months ethmoidal one develops on 1 year sphenoid one develops on 4 years while the frontal one develops on 6 years while the frontal one develops on 6 years among that maxillary sinus most common site of your maxillary sinusitis in children so sorry most common site for sinusitis in children is maxillary sinus we use a waters view for the maxillary sinus that we have discussed already in the image based question then you have ethmoidal sinus and frontal sinus that can be viewed through the caldwell view which we have seen the images already and bucket handle view is used for the uh, viewing of fracture of zygomaticus bucket handle view is for the fracture of zygomaticus then you are having a throat tonsillitis ketral you may see the viral infection associated with the ketral and a follicular type of tonsillitis is spread of krebs and you have a parenchymal one inflamed tonsillar substance and a hemorrhage one exudation of krebs hemorrhagic one exudation of krebs then you have a trotus triad trotus triad is associated with the nasopharyngeal angiofibroma where cranial nerve 2 3 4 and 6 will be involved cranial nerve 2 3 4 and 6 will be involved investigation of choices ct scan investigation of choices ct scan so trotus triad nasopharyngeal angiofibroma where cranial nerve 2 3 4 and 6 is involved investigation of choices ct scan and what is the level of larynx length of larynx is 44 mm in male and 36 mm in female and level of larynx c3 at birth c6 at 5 year old and 15 to 20 year old it is c7 15 to 20 year old it is c7 then you have a cartilage three pad cartilage which are arytenoid carniculate and cuneiform while three unpaired ones are epiglottis cricoid and thyroid epiglottis cricoid and thyroid one so all of the following muscles are supplied by recurrent laryngeal nerve except cricothyroid classical mcq all of the following muscles are supplied by recurrent laryngeal nerve except cricothyroid which is supplied by your superior laryngeal nerve which is supplied by your superior laryngeal nerve another important mcq what are the paired cartilage arytenoid carniculate and cuneiform what are the unpaired one epiglottis cricoid and thyroid so level of cartilage between in a phase 15 to 20 year old patients is c7 as c7 then you are having a direct laryngoscopy and indirect laryngoscopy images and a singers nodule singers nodule this is a singers nodule you may see that the singers nodule and apart from that you may have the laryngomalacia laryngomalacia where you may see the omega epiglottis where you may see the omega epiglottis where you may see the noisy breathing in the infancy noisy breathing in the infancy is a classical uh, the clue they may give you for the clinical vineyard and then you have this vocal polyp which is a fluid filled collection to form the edge of your vocal cord mostly associated with the vocal trauma okay vocal trauma then you have a quincy potato voice is so called as quincy and apart from that laryngocele where the dilated sacculus seen in trumpet players and you may see the benign lesion very very rare that benign lesion is a very very rare so laryngocele uh, mostly associated with the abnormal dilatation and uh, uh, mostly associated with the trumpet players then you have a juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma uh, which is a frog face deformity frog face deformity is seen in the jna and apart from the rhinophyma which is a potato nose which is also seen in the hypertrophy of your sebaceous gland heimlich maneuver uh, choking procedure one of the classical image they ask what maneuver it is heimlich maneuver 
ethmoidal nasal polyp are there ethmoidal nasal polyps was there and the lifotic injury you know like a mid face fracture which is commonly associated with the fracture of your maxilla mandible and sometimes it may involve in the sphenoid and zygomaticus too okay depending upon the grade grade 1 2 3 will be there and then you have a rhinosporidiasis mulberry like ma nasal mass will be there mulberry like nasal mass will be there and it is caused by rhinosporidium sebri rhinosporidium sebri then apart from that rhinoscleroma udinos and ongren line you may see here the ongren line and apart from that uh, weber ferguson approach for total maxillectomy and uh, you may see the mucor mycosis blackish discoloration on the skin around the nose and the eyes is so called as mucor mycosis where we you may see that there is a uh, mucor mycosis is associated with the immunocompromised patients such as uh, diabetes hiv and post covid one or the can able to show this mucor mycosis result then you have atrophic rhinitis atrophic rhinitis image you may see here near the you may see the crust to the nasal cavity image apart from that epistasis bleeding from your nose and we to start about we talked about the you know like a kesselbach fluxes and woodruff fluxes we both have done and apart from that malignant otitis externa which is associated with the base of the skull uh, in uh, you know like infection and uh, uh, it is due to the pseudomonas aeruginosa then you have a retraction pocket which is a localized retraction of your uh, tympanic membrane then you have a blom singer prosthesis then you have a blom singer prosthesis grommet insertion tracheostomy tube very 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 classical one cuffed and uncuffed then you may see the waters view we have already discussed that mckeevan's triangle mckeevan's triangle is also known as a supramiatal triangle where the temporal bone just superior to the auditory external auditory canal used to locate the mastoid antrum used to locate the mastoid antrum and apart from that seagull speculum while welsham forceps and ash forceps welsham forceps is used for the closed reduction of your nasal bone fracture while ash forceps is used for the reduction of nasal septum fracture and you have a seagull speculum where you may see the pneumatic otoscopy okay which is a pneumatic otoscopy instrument where you can able to perform it so these are the important images you may see apart from that few other images are there apart from that few other images are there one is your uh, ort ossicular replacement prosthesis and another one is your schwart sign another one is your schwart sign you may see it in the otosclerosis and otoscope image and apart from that stape piston prosthesis for otosclerosis stapes piston prosthesis for auto sclerosis so these are the important ones you may see it in the case of your ent so speaking about that ent the high yield areas we have covered it and the high yield images we have covered it quite a very 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 important ones people all the things in the notes may you may expect to see it in the mcqs technically it is one of the notes where you can able to Uh, you know like uh, master the important and high yield content in the ent so orthopedics and ent have been done tomorrow we may do the remaining to another two subjects and uh, if as per the situation we proceed along okay so far we have done anatomy physiology biochemistry pathology micro pharma patho fsm psm internal medicine surgery obstetrics gynecology and uh, you know ent and we have done anesthesia and radiology uh, sorry anesthesia dermatology and orthopedics we have done so almost like we have covered 85 percentage of your fmge portion in this day remaining only 10 to 15 percent that will be covered on the tomorrow if not tomorrow we can be covering then day after tomorrow is the another day we can able to take and finish off this revision program so so far we have done and apart from that you may be having a expected mcq session that you need to cover it up and uh, apart from that you may have a break for your fmg so that you can able to read and recall so you are having a plenty of time people read recall 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 as i say always 
read and read and read again okay that's the strategy people there is no other strategy read read and read again and revise and master the mcqs that's the typical strategy i always say for the fmg so all the very best we wrap up for the today and see you tomorrow with the new subject and see you tomorrow with the new subject see you people